Thanks for joining us today on Arirang News. I'm Lee Ji-yoon in Seoul. We begin over at the nation's top office. President Park Geun-hye says she will reshuffle her staff and cabinet to improve efficiency. At a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, she said the small-scale cabinet shakeup represents a fresh start for the new year and will help the government carry out her economic reform plans. The president also talked about appointing special advisors who will work with the nation's political parties to carry out her state policies. As for the latest case of child abuse at a daycare center, the president called on officials to enforce the government's new one-strikeout system. Under this system, a single case of child abuse would shut down the responsible daycare center and ban guilty caretakers from working in similar jobs. A South Korean activist group flew 100,000 anti-North Korea leaflets across the inter-Korean border Monday night. The leader of the civic group, Fighters for a Free North Korea, said Tuesday that the leaflets were sent from the border city of Paju by some 20 U.S. activists from the Human Rights Foundation. However, they didn't send DVDs of the interview, a, com a comedy film about an assassination plot against North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The South Korean activists have threatened to launch the DVDs if North Korea doesn't accept Seoul's offer for talks. Last week, the government asked civic groups to refrain from launching such leaflets, as doing so would likely stir up tensions on the Korean Peninsula. The U.S. National Security Agency has apparently been tapping into North Korea's computer networks since long before the North hacked into Sony Pictures. Officials say the data collected through the top-secret operation is what made it possible for the U.S. to pin the attack on North Korea. Our Kim Hyun-bin tells us more. The U.S. National Security Agency has exploited North Korea's computer systems since 2010 in a top-secret cyber operation conducted with the help of South Korea and other U.S. allies. A report published in the New York Times on Monday says the American spy agency probed Chinese networks that connect North Korea to the outside world, getting direct access in the North. The paper quotes officials who say malware was placed in Pyongyang's computer systems so the NSA could track networks and computers used by North Korean hackers. A force the South Korean military estimates at roughly 6,000. Most are controlled by Pyongyang's main intelligence service, the Reconnaissance General Bureau and Bureau 121 a covert hacking unit that has a large outpost in China. Before the Sony case, the United States had never directly accused another country of launching a cyber attack on it. Senior military officials say the evidence gathered through the software and presented to President Barack Obama left him no doubt that Pyongyang was responsible. One formal U.S. official said that when the U.S. first gained access to the North's computer networks, it was mainly focused on the North's nuclear program and its leadership as well as direct military threats to U.S. and Seoul. But the surveillance program was expanded after a destructive attack on South Korea's banks and media companies in 2013. The story is now raising questions among experts in the U.S. about why. According to one source, American intelligence agencies couldn't really understand the severity of the situation given the time they spent inside the North's computer networks and why they weren't able to warn Sony about the attack. Kim Hyun-bin. Arirang News. Meanwhile, the Korean government says the sixth round of talks with Japan on the issue of wartime sex slavery was meaningful and constructive. The statement comes after Korea's chief delegate Lee Sang-duk and his Japanese counterpart Junichi Hara met for three hours in Tokyo on Monday. After the talks, he said the two sides will continue to try to reach a solution, but that he couldn't say too much given that the talks are supposed to be confidential. Korea wants a sincere apology from Japan and compensation for the victims, but Tokyo says the issue was dealt with in a bilateral treaty signed in 1965. The meeting comes as Korea and Japan are trying to improve their frosty relations as this year marks the 50th anniversary of the normalization of their bilateral ties. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says human tragedies such as the Holocaust should never be repeated again. 
His message came while he was visiting the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem. However, Abe fell short of mentioning his country's own wartime atrocities. With more, here's our Hong Sung-hee. Laying a wreath at the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem on Monday, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe condemned the war crimes committed by Nazi Germany. Today, I learned how merciless humans can be by singling out a group of people and making them the object of discrimination and hatred. Abe recalled Chinue Sugihara, a Japanese diplomat who saved thousands of Jews during World War II. Chiyune Sugihara gave hope to Jewish refugees by signing transit visas for them to escape to Japan. A senior Japanese foreign ministry official said the message was to cover Abe's overall diplomacy for this year, which falls on the 70th anniversary of the war's end. But Abe made no mention of Japan's own wartime atrocities, such as its sexual enslavement of some 200,000 women, many of whom were Korean. Such acts are seen as part of Abe's efforts to dispel international misgivings that he's trying to revise history. Korea and China, the major victims of Japan's militaristic past, continue to call on Tokyo to issue a sincere apology for its past wrongdoings. While Tokyo's relations with its neighbors remain at a historic low, all eyes are on the so-called Abe Statement to be issued in August, which is expected to express Japan's remorse over the war. Hwang sang Arirang News. Many salaried workers here in Korea weren't so happy about the country's tax law revisions, saying that they now have to pay more taxes. But Korea's finance minister said this morning that is not true. Our Hwang Jie has the details. A public outcry forced Korean Finance Minister Che kyung hwan to stand before reporters on Tuesday over the government's change in tax policy. He said the change that comes into force this year aims to redistribute wealth to low-income families. Changing tax benefits from tax deductions into tax credits will raise the tax burden on high-income earners but will decrease the burden on low-income workers. Many salaried workers have been slamming the government, saying they will face heavier tax burden under the new system. The minister responded that while the government had collected more tax every month and returned the balance later, the new tax policy collects less every month and returns less. But he did pledge to monitor the tax burdens. We are reviewing better ways to settle income tax, including tax reduction for retirees and families with many children. Korea's tax revenue has fallen short of the target in the past few years, with the deficit for last year estimated at around 9 to 14 billion U.S. dollars. For this year, the National Assembly Budget Office estimated the shortfall will reach around 2.8 billion dollars. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Korea, a major importer of oil, stands to reap economic benefits from the recent slump in global crude oil prices. Analysts estimate that Korea could save as much as nearly $40 billion. Our Kim Min-ji has more. Korea is expected to benefit from tumbling crude prices. According to the IMF and the Korea Energy Economic Institute, the cost of Korea's oil consumption is expected to drop to 1.7 percent of the GDP this year. That's the lowest level in 45 years. The estimate is based on an IMF forecast for global oil prices of $56.7 per barrel this year, a drop of 41 percent from a year earlier. The price slump of oil, along with other energy sources, is expected to create economic benefits for Korea in savings of between $19 billion and $38 billion. 
But who stands to see the biggest savings? For starters, households are expected to save an average of about $300 a year. It's estimated that oil consumption will make up about 3.5 percent of their total spending this year, down from roughly 4.3 percent last year. Businesses are likely to see savings as well. Analysts estimate that for every 10 percent drop in oil prices, Korea's exports jump 0.5 percent and production costs fall 1 percent. And considering that the IMF estimate for the global oil price is down more than 40 percent from last year, Korea's exports are expected to jump more than 2 percent, and the manufacturing sector would save about 4 percent in production costs this year. All in all, households are expected to save at least $10 billion, businesses $4 billion, and the government $2 billion. Experts say the economic benefits from the price drop will begin to show in the second quarter of the year. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Unpleasant news for all you job seekers out there. Unemployment rate across the world is expected to continue to rise over the next few years due to the slow global economic recovery. The International Labor Organization's World Employment and Social Outlook Trends 2015 report said about 212 million people will be jobless by 2019. The number rising from the current 200 million. While the report saw improved employment in the U.S. and Japan, it still found conditions in some European nations worrisome. Latin America, Africa, and Arab nations will also feel the pinch due to the falling oil and gas prices. The organization warns rising unemployment could result in income inequality and social unrest. As the price war between OPEC nations and U.S. producer heats up, Iran has come out to say the industry is healthy enough to withstand the falling crude oil prices, even if it drops below $30 a barrel. Our Shin Zemin explains. Iran's oil minister has stressed that its country's oil industry can easily ride out a long period of low prices, even saying Iran will be fine if prices drop to 25 U.S. dollars a barrel. Iran's state-run Fars News Agency says Bijan Zanganeya told reporters during a conference in Tehran that Iran sees no sign of a shift within OPEC towards action to support oil prices. Oil prices have tumbled nearly 30 percent since OPEC made its decision late last year to keep production unchanged at 30 million barrels a day. On Monday, Brent crude oil prices fell below $49 a barrel, pressured by a supply glut and OPEC's refusal to cut its output. And as a major oil producer, Iran is pushing hard not to hold an emergency meeting regarding falling global oil prices. The group's next scheduled meeting is set for June 5th. The minister says his country doesn't intend to hold an emergency meeting and is currently in talks with other OPEC member states in a bid to hold up falling oil prices, but these talks haven't been successful yet. Shin Semin, Arirang News. The world's second largest economy, China, posted its slowest growth in 24 years last year. China's Statistics Bureau said Tuesday that the country's gross domestic product expanded at 7.4% in 2014, missing Beijing's target by a tenth of a percentage point. Also, the Chinese economy grew 7.3% during the October to December period last year. Despite this, the head of China's Statistics Bureau says that he's satisfied with the lower, albeit steadier, growth. He said the 7.4 percent growth figure suits the, quote, new normal of economic development that China currently faces amid a global economic slowdown. The question now is how the Chinese government will deal with its relatively moderate growth, a setback to an economy used to double-digit growth. As the world's elite begin to converge at the Swiss ski resort of Davos ahead of this year's World Economic Forum, a fresh report from Oxfam shows a startling trend. The world's richest 1% is poised to hold more wealth than the remaining 99% by next year. The anti-poverty group said a study found the richest of the rich have seen their share of global assets grow consistently in recent years to reach 48% last year, or roughly 2.7 million U.S. dollars each. 
This as the bottom 80% of the world's population own just 5.5% of the world's wealth, an average of $3,700 each. Oxfam's director calling the scale of global inequality staggering, said the organization will demand urgent action to tackle the growing divide between the rich and the poor when political and business leaders converge in Davos this week. Korea now ranks fifth in terms of global auto production and it's number three in terms of auto exports. Our Chi Myung Gil takes a look back on the last 60 years of the Korean auto industry and how companies like Hyundai and Kia have established themselves in the global market. It's been 60 years since Korea manufactured its first car, the Shibai, back in 1955. The car, whose name translates as New Start, was created by adding a Korean engine to a U.S. military jeep. Later in the 60s, the Korean government announced a series of measures to promote the auto industry. These efforts led to the establishment, in conjunction with foreign automakers, of three automobile companies, two of which are still in business, Hyundai and Kia Motors. With the technical assistance, Korea built its first modern assembly facilities and began assembling cars. Through continued collaborations with foreign car companies, Korea's first homegrown automobile, the Hyundai Pony, was built in 1975. Hyundai chalked up another first when it exported the Pony to South America in 1976. Then in the 80s, Korean automakers began focusing on developing mass production systems to build an export-oriented industry. And on January 20th, 1986, Hyundai entered the U.S. market with its Pony XL. It sold more than 168,000 cars, setting a record for selling the most cars in its first year of business. Three years later, on the back of its initial success in the export market, Hyundai began designing and producing vehicles with its own technology. Last year, overseas shipments of Korean vehicles stood at more than 3 million units, and the value of Korea's auto exports reached an all-time high of nearly 49 billion U.S. dollars. Hyundai and Kia Motors said Tuesday they had exported 100,000 vehicles for each of 17 car models last year. Now, as they pass the 60-year mark, Korean automakers are plugging into the latest trend and developing eco-friendly vehicles. Kim Young Arirang News. And moving on to the second report in our five-part series on startups here in Korea. Today we're going to focus on one specific startup in the food delivery business that has broken new ground. Our Kim ji tells us about the secret behind its success. A number of apps have popped up in recent years, enabling users to order food without ever making a phone call. One of these is Pedal Minjok by a startup company called Ua Brothers, and it's getting a lot of attention. The app, launched in 2010, is known for its user friendly mobile platform. A commercial for the app, which looks like a movie trailer, went viral on social networking sites and YouTube. <laughs> Pedal Minzo currently dominates the app based food delivery sector, estimated to be worth 1 trillion Korean won or 928 million US dollars. Over 5 million deliveries were made through the app last month alone, with 150,000 restaurants participating nationwide. But what makes this company stand out is its potential, fueled by a major investment from Goldman Sachs. I think the $36 million investment from Goldman Sachs shows a level of confidence, not just in Perari Minjok, but the, Sam, the Seoul uh, startup ecosystem. Um, there's a great level of talent. There are wonderful universities here pumping out incredibly educated students. Um, there is investment coming in. And then the most important thing, there's drive and hunger to want to build. What's the secret behind getting so much attention? What, what's the secret behind your success? Sure. I think one of the best things about this company is that because of the structure that we have, anybody at any level can voice their opinion, and uh, their opinion is extremely valuable. This flat structure helps to better cater to consumer trends, with the timely execution of ideas. It also sets the company apart from most Korean firms and startups that follow a top-down structure. 
So what's next? It plans to broaden its takeout focus to include all types of restaurants. The company also wants to go global. It has already partnered up with Line, a mobile messaging app owned by Korea's largest portal neighbor to expand into Japan. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Here in Korea, we often refer to pansori as our version of opera. And like the opera, pansori has hundreds of years of history behind it. But now this traditional form of musical storytelling is in danger of becoming a dying art. Luckily, there are people trying to stop that from happening. Our Im Yoon tells us more. Some say it's never too early to begin training. At the young age of eight, these little girls have begun a journey unfamiliar to most kids their age. Their ultimate goal is to become a pansori master. To make sure they get there, they've been taken under the wing of one of Korea's leading pansori masters, an effort aimed at producing a new generation of performers. But it's the passion of these young artists that makes the biggest impression. As the drum is being played and I hear the voices of others and my mood is lifted, sometimes I even want to dance. At the start of the new year, these students and others, all under the guidance of Master Cho so Nyo, entered an intense training camp for 15 days, where they can learn all about the traditional art of pansori. Becoming a pansori master is no easy task. It may be below zero outside on a cold winter morning, but these students are up for the challenge. Singing outside, I can hear our voices, but the sound is also echoed and amplified. This wide, open environment is very inspiring. And who better to herd the young fledglings than Cho so Nyo, a pansori master who has even been declared an intangible cultural asset herself for her expert knowledge of Chunyang, one of the songs in the pansori repertoire. It's comforting to be able to study pansori with all these students. Hopefully, they will continue to become great pansori masters. Although these young girls have dedicated themselves to pansori, the harsh reality is that in the modern day, the number of those looking to learn the art has decreased dramatically, putting at risk the future of this age-old Korean tradition. Still, it's a beautiful part of Korea's culture, and we hope they carry forward for generations to come. Im Yoon Hee, Arirang News. Welcome back. I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. Today is Daehan in Korea, which is one of the coldest day of the season under the 24 solar terms that are part of the East Asian Lunar Solar Calendar. Now, this morning was the perfect evidence of that, with the temperatures dropping down to negative 6 degrees. However, we'll see a huge jump, and the daytime highs are expected to be above the seasonal average and way above freezing as well. Now, going over to our satellite map, we can expect a sunny day today, although more clouds are expected to move in throughout the day. And also, the air quality is looking good with a fine dust level at normal for all regions across the country. Now, going over to our readings for today, so we'll peak up to 4 this afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan is looking milder at 7 and 10 degrees, respectively. And moving over to other regions, Jeju Island gets up to 9 as well. Tokyo hits down to 7, while Mount Kungang drops low to negative 3 degrees. Well, that's all for now, Michelle Park, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world.
And that brings us to the end of our newscast. But stay tuned for more updates on our next newscast at 6 p.m. Korea time. Thanks for watching.